Good morning, everyone. I uh, just returned from two weeks. I was away. Um, you know, it's funny because as we're looking in this book of Daniel, we're reading about how they were exiled to Babylon, the Israelites. I was actually exiled the last couple of weeks to Malibu, California. It was awful. It was horrible. Um, and I will never be the same. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I have to clarify. So um, I am studying to get my doctorate and uh, through Fuller Seminary, which is down in Pasadena. And it's largely done online. A lot of, you know, it's a remote program. So, but once a year, all the students and the professors meet for 10 days. It's called an intensive, where we basically, you know, learn a year's worth of learning in 10 days. Um, so they do this at this retreat center, this Franciscan retreat center down in Malibu, right near Pepperdine, up on this beautiful um, hillside, and hilltop, actually. And um, so I went down there. So it wasn't like all fun and games, believe me. In fact, we started at like 7.30 in the morning. We had a three-hour break in the afternoon, and then we were at it again in the evening until 9. So this wasn't like, you know, this was not the lap of luxury. This was work. And, but then we had a weekend, like, right in between our classes, and I was like, oh, good, you know, finally, we can just, like, relax a little bit. Well, no, they wanted us, they set up for us a silent retreat for the whole weekend. <laughs> and so I'm there with my husband, so this was kind of interesting to be in silence together all weekend. Um, and I, you know, what, they, what they're trying to do is um, foster ways for us to keep growing closer to God in our own walk so that when we're using the things we learn, we're not just speaking from books, but from our own experience. So it's, it's wonderful, and I appreciated this gift of silence, and uh, the grounds are so beautiful there, and uh, so I spent my first day of silence walking around and praying, lots of praying and journaling, and I took a holy nap, which is, by the way, two hours, a two-hour nap is a holy nap. Um, you know, I had lots of time to do those things, so it was great. I could just slow down and um, really just be with God. And so then in the afternoon of the first day there, I decided I was going to go. Um, it's so hilly there, and I was like, okay, I'm going to get some exercise. So I put my sneakers on, and I went down the hill that the, the friary was on and went down and started walking through this gated community and uh, started looking at the homes that were all around me and started looking at the cars that were passing by me and started thinking about, you know, one of the friars had told us all the stars who lived down in this gated community. And so I kept thinking, oh, maybe I'll run into Mel Gibson while I'm out on my walk, you know? Like, maybe, you know, you never know who I might see. And I'm, my mind is going down this road. And it got to this point where I was, like, peering over fences to look in backyard. I mean, I'm not kidding you. It was bad. It was bad. And I don't consider myself like this materialistic person, but I really wanted to see their pools and even their patio furniture. It is beyond belief, you know. And so I'm walking on these beautiful roads, and I am getting exercise. I'm a little out of breath. But I start fantasizing about living in this home and that home, and all of a sudden that beautiful inner peace <laughs> that I had had back up on the hill was now just kind of this feeling of almost like self-pity and um, a lot of wishfulness, uh, which we might otherwise call covetousness. Um, and so I started feeling really uneasy, and I was like, this isn't good for me. You know, I'm going to go back up to the friary. And so I went back up the hill and, uh, you know, regained my center and, uh, you know, had the rest of our lovely weekend in silence. But it taught me a lot that really it doesn't take much to get me off track. And so it was good that we had all this, this time to really be with God. And so then a couple days after that weekend, I went back down to the, uh, the bottom of the hill. There was a Whole Foods there, and I love Whole Foods, and I wanted to go in and get a kombucha. And I went in, and I was standing in line with my drink, and um, this guy in front of me um, realized that I only had one item, and he was like, how can you only have one item here? And I said, I know, I love it. We don't have one where I'm from. And we started chatting. So he, like, was this really tanned, you know, the shock of white hair, and uh, he had all this gold on his fingers and uh, these chains, you know. And I, like, looked down at his feet, and he had, like, these, like, slippers on with dragons embroidered on them. And I'm like, who is this guy, right? You know, like, what is going on here? And so, you know, we're chatting, 
And um, I told them how the day before, or a couple days before, I was out, you know, walking around in the beautiful neighborhood. And he said to me, he said, don't be fooled. And he said, I know people that own those $30 million homes. And he said, they are miserable. He said, they are very unhappy. There is a lot of problems around here. And he said, a lot of addiction, a lot of alcoholism. He said, it is not what it appears. And I said, oh, God, you know, like I needed to hear that. You know, it was like, what are you doing here, God? You're, you're at work through this man with the dragon slippers, you know, telling me, and you know, all this gold on, that, you know, it, it's not how it appears, right? Well, I knew that, but it was just, it was a reassurance to me. And I really have just um, praised God that I don't have all those troubles in my life. My life is much simpler than that. And so the reason I'm telling this story is because as we go into this particular part of Daniel, we're going to see um, how things are not always as they appear on the surface, that there's another reality, another truth underneath how things appear. So last week, we heard more about King Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, we heard about how he was full of pride and finally was... Um, learned a lesson of humility the hard way. And so now we're in chapter 5, and he's done. We, we hear no more about him. He's off the scene. It's 20 years later, and now it's, talk, it's talking about, the narrator is talking about um, a king named Belshazzar. And there was actually no Babylonian king named Belshazzar. And what archaeologists have found is that he's the son of the king, Nabonidus, and this particular king had gone out of the capital for 10 years to build temples for, for his favorite god all around Babylon. And he left his son, Belshazzar, in charge. And so he was the king at the time, so it was correct to call him king. So we learn that he's there. He's in the palace, and he decides he wants to throw this amazing banquet. He invites a 1,000 people to this banquet, and there's lots of drinking, lots of wine flowing. And um, so then he decides that uh, all those temple vessels that Nebuchadnezzar had stolen from the temple in Israel, and they've just been kind of in storage, he got them out, and he said, let's just drink from all these Israelite, you know, vessels. And so they start drinking their wine out of the temple vessels from, from Jerusalem. And what's more than that is they decided to start praising the gods of these vessels. So the god of stone, the god of bronze, and they decided that not only were they going to drink out of these vessels, but they were going to praise the gods who made these vessels. And so um, this would be the ultimate act of blasphemy. And so the ancient uh, readers of this would understand that this was the equivalent of basically spitting in the face of God. This was basically saying, you know, my gods are better than yours, my power is greater, my kingdom is in control. And so Belshazzar, on the surface, he seems a lot like Nebuchadnezzar, but he's so much worse because of this blasphemy. And so then we read this immediately after this, this time of revelry. This is what we read. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. So I don't blame him, do you? I mean, this hand just kind of appears and starts writing on the wall. It's this kind of supernatural experience. And so in the same manner that his forefather, Nebuchadnezzar, had done, he calls for all of the, the wise men of Babylon and all the astrologers and the magicians, and he says, come, interpret this, this writing for me. And of course, none of them could do it because uh, it was from the hand of God, and they couldn't, they couldn't decipher it. So the queen mother comes in, and she says, you know, this is ridiculous. Remember Daniel? <laughs> Daniel is around, and Daniel is the only one that can interpret this stuff, so you, you should call him. So Belshazzar calls him in, and he says, look, Daniel, if you can interpret this writing, I will clothe you in royal clothes, put gold on you, and I will make you third in command of my kingdom. And Daniel's like, I don't want any of that. He rejects it. He says, no thanks. I'm going to do this free of charge. So what he does is he... he First, he rebukes Belshazzar, and he says, look, you know, Nebuchadnezzar was bad, you're worse. <laughs> and he says, there's doom for you here. 
And then he finally says, you know, you didn't honor the God. At least Nebuchadnezzar, he honored God, Yahweh God, who holds his, in his hand your life and all your ways. And he said, so now God has sent this hand with this inscription, and this is what it said. He says, this is, what the, inscription, uh, this is the inscription that was written. Uh, mene, mene, tekel, parson. So that's Aramaic, and they are forms of, of money. They're types of money. Um, so like we would say quarter, dollar, or something like that. They're many, many tekel parson. And he says, here's what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. So your days are numbered. You're done. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. So there's something seriously wrong with your character here. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So guess what? Babylonians, done, Medes and Persians coming in. And the story ends with exactly that happening that night. <laughs> in come the Medes, they take over, done with the Babylonians. That, that story is over. No more Babylonians in charge. So this is where we get the expression, the writing is on the wall. Right? You know, I mean, we use that. I don't know if you've ever used it or you've certainly heard it. They say it a lot in, uh, you know, a lot of literature. I actually Googled it, and there's a lot of news headlines that use it. The writing is on the wall for such and such, right? And what it means is that there's an end to something coming. There's doom or bad news is around the corner, right? And so that's where we, we get this from. And so the, the not-so-good news for Belshazzar is that his days are numbered. He's going to be done. And, uh, you know, he's got some serious character flaws that are just hopeless. And then now the Babylonian kingdom is going to end. So boom, just like that, doom, right on the wall. But what we are going to do today is we're going to read a little bit between those lines, and we're going to use our biblical imagination. So, for instance, who is the main character of the story? Well, it's not Belshazzar. And it's not Daniel. It's... God. God is the main character because literally this is about the hand of God at work. And where was God at work? Well, this was in the exile, right? They were in a place, the Israelites were sent to a place despite their will, and they were, they were exiled out of their own land, the promised land, and they had to go to this foreign land where they needed to try to maintain viable lifestyles and their faith. I mean, if I had that much problem with one hour of a walk in Malibu amongst hedonism and consumerism, I can't imagine what 70 years in Babylon must have been like for these people, right? All these pagan gods, all this stuff that competes for their attention, and they're in exile trying to remain faithful. And so this is a big event in the story of the Israelites, you know, that this exile, it, it forced them to ask the big questions of faith. You know, one of the core beliefs that they had was that God's presence, his very presence, resided in the temple in Jerusalem. So if they're removed from Jerusalem, they are now removed from God's presence. So this was a big deal for them. But this is what the story is revealing. God makes God's self known in exile. God is present even outside of the land of promise. There's no place that is beyond God's sovereignty. There's no place too desolated, too isolated, or desecrated where God can't come in and work powerfully. So Belshazzar, he blasphemed the Lord, and he paid the consequences because God is sovereign, and God turns evil on itself. That's what God did. Nothing is outside of God's power, his hand. It's a big moment for the Israelites to learn this while they're in exile. And uh, so they see that God's hand is at work. And now if we switch gears a little bit, we're going to go into the New Testament where Paul is addressing the Roman church of Christians who are under persecution by the Roman Empire. And this is what Paul says. He says, you know, who shall separate us? from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution 
or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. I mean, he's listing pretty much everything that could happen, right? Nothing can separate us. He says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then many of us have this memorized, this particular scripture. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, no, no height nor depth, nothing else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is, is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, Paul can say this confidently because he knows that there is a greater kingdom at work than the Roman Empire. And it's greater than the Babylonians, greater than the Medes and the Persians. It's the kingdom of God. And you and I, we live in that kingdom, the eternal kingdom. It's not something that we enter when we die. <laughs> We're in it right now. It's existing Remember, when Jesus came on the scene, he said that the kingdom of God is at hand. <laughs> it's available for us. We're part of that kingdom. We, we're not waiting for it. We're waiting for it to be fully brought to life here, but we are participating in it. We're invited to leave behind the earthly darkness, to kind of step out of that and step into the light of the kingdom. And it happens when we align ourselves with God's will, when we work for God's purposes on earth, when we obey our Lord Jesus Christ. That's when we're participating in this kingdom of God. It's another reality. It's the true reality. It's what's at work underneath the things that we can see. And God is not just passively watching us, right? His hand is always writing, always and our God wants to write his words on our stories. He wants to. He wants his reality, the true reality, to become ours. So let me ask you, what is your place of exile in your life right now? We, we all have exile places. Where might you be experiencing exile? You know, maybe it's a literal place. Maybe at your place of work, you might be surrounded by secular living and maybe to such an extreme that you feel like you want to fit in, but you don't want to gossip or tell inappropriate jokes and you're really having hard struggling with that, right? It could be a literal place like that. Or maybe your exile place is an area of your life <laughs> that you would rather control on your own and kind of tell God to stay out of that. Right? Maybe how you manage your money, or how you use your time, or how you parent, or who you choose to date or marry. Well, I've got that, God. You can leave that to me. Maybe that's your exile place. Or maybe there's something from your past or something in your present that you feel shameful about. You want to hide it from yourself or from God. Maybe it's an addiction or a pornography habit or a resentment towards someone an act of sin from your past that you really just don't think God could have forgiven you for. You know, we all have exile places. There are places in our lives that feel distant from God or places where we just kind of want to keep God at a distance. <laughs> you know, I was with a, a group of moms earlier this week, and we were talking about how difficult it is, even at, into adulthood, as our kids get into adulthood, to release them to God's control. <laughs> How difficult that is. I want to control what my kid is doing all the time. No, it's up to God. <laughs> it's difficult. So we all have these exile places, and our view, what we can actually see in this world, is so limited. Right? It's not just Belshazzar whose days are numbered. Our days are numbered, too. <laughs> Our days will come to an end someday, too. And we can only see the future reality just so far, right? When we're driving on a road in darkness, our headlights show us just so many feet ahead. They don't illuminate the whole route all at once. We, we can only see just so far. But God has the big picture. God can see. God can use evil and turn it on, our, on itself. 
and God will make good happen. He meets us in our exile places. Now, a bit of a spoiler alert for next week, and I don't see Henry, so maybe I can give you more of a spoiler. Henry. Okay, all right, so I'm just going to forward ahead to next week's story. Here's the thing. This is doom, this writing on the wall for the Babylonians, because they're, they're coming to an end. Done. But guess what? It's good news for the Israelites. What's bad news for the Babylonians is good news for the Israelites. There is hope and restoration right around the corner for them. So we'll see that next week. But what looks like doom and gloom on the outside is God's hand at work doing good. And so the defeat of the Babylonians will mean hope for the Israelites because nothing could separate them from the love of God. It's a love that redeems, restores, rewrites. So when on the surface we see something that looks like doom, there's another story going on. Or, conversely, when we see something that looks like a $35 million home in Malibu, there, there's something else going on, right? Things are not always the way they appear. God wants to come into our life situations, whatever is happening in our lives, and he wants to write his story on ours. You see, when the hand of God wrote that prophetic word on the wall, it was the true reality, the kingdom of God reality. And he wants to do that in all of our lives. So what might God be writing over your story right now? Do you lose your job? Is your best friend holding a grudge against you and won't talk to you? Do you have to have one more surgery after the last one because the, fir the first one didn't work? Are you barely scraping by financially day to day? Or maybe your child won't talk to you. You know, we see doom in, the, in our lives sometimes, and that's all we can see sometimes. But God wants to write over that. Maybe God wants to write between the lines. Maybe God wants to take a big eraser and erase some of the story and rewrite it for us. You see, God's in the business of restoration, and there is never anything that happens in our lives without God wanting us to see that there's another reality being written. Our characters are being formed. We're learning patience, forgiveness, forbearance. When we read between the lines of the doom of the writing, we will find that God is present. He's working. He's writing a different story. So courageous living for us today is looking for where God's hand is at work. Where might God be writing something over or between or in the margins of what's going on at surface level. So someone told me earlier this week that she's been praying for a circumstance in her life. It's actually for a loved one of hers who keeps making foolish decisions, and she keeps praying, God, please, please change this. And she said he keeps doing it over and over again, and she said, nothing is changing. I keep praying, but nothing's changing. And so I said to her, well, the question is, does that mean that God is not at work? And it reminded me of the story, it's a song from Laura Story. And we, I don't know if we've ever sung it here. I, I think we have over at the, the sanctuary. It's a contemporary song. It's called Blessings. Maybe some of you know it. And the lyrics say, we pray for blessings, we pray for peace, comfort for family, protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. All the while you hear each spoken need Yet love is way too much to give us lesser things. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? We pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. We cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness, we doubt your love as if every promise from your word is not enough. All the while, you hear each desperate plea and long that we'd have faith to believe. When friends betray us, when darkness seems to win, we know that pain reminds this heart that this is not our home. 
You know, last year I experienced a, an exile place in my own life. I had a very difficult situation that I kept praying to God that he would change. <laughs> Literally, I would say, change this, please. <laughs> please, God, please change this. And then I would say, when it wasn't happening, I would say, can you just change this little bit of it? <laughs> could you change a little portion of it? Could, could, could you maybe do this? Nothing changed. And so finally one day I was sitting on my back patio and I was just sitting in silence and I heard God say, Shannon, you change. Wait, wait, no, 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 what? <laughs> you change. Now, can you write that? Can you put that in writing somewhere? I mean, I don't, I'm not hearing you write. Me change? You see, God was writing another reality over mine. He knew that something in my character needed to change through this difficult situation. He knew that there was a reality underneath. It was a mercy in disguise, as the lyrics said. And so now I can look back, right? We can always look back in hindsight and we can see things, right? And I, I look back and I can see all the things that I learned about God, about my life, about the world, just because this doom and ugly situation on the outside did not change. But instead, I drew close to God to see where he was working through it. You see, God's hand is writing something else. It's a deeper reality, and it's about the eternal kingdom that we are participating in. So friends, God wants to make himself known in our exile places. That's what he did for them, and he's doing to this day. He's making himself known, and he wants to write his story on ours. He wants us to look for the reality that's underneath what we can see because that's not the real reality. So God is sovereign. God is at work in our exile places, and what may appear as doom on the surface is a place for us to experience God's hope, God's love, God's restorative power. As courageous people, we are more than conquerors. We say, God, I can't see. All I can see is doom here. Show me something. Show me where your hand is at work. That's all we need to pray. We just say, show me. <laughs> where is your hand at work? Looking for God's writing on our lives. And friends, know this, that God always has love that he's writing over our lives because nothing separates us from his love. We are always under his providential care, no matter where we are in our lives. And this is good news for us today. Amen. Let's pray.